Well, um, I'm now 54 and I never thought that I would be a composer when I was 14. So at this time I was more interested in natural science and I made a special school for chemistry and I was very much interested in all these experiments with chemicals and with the idea of synthesis and analysis of substances. But at this time when I was a teenager I became very much interested in a special kind of rock music which grabbed me completely so I started to concentrate on music basically. So I started to play guitar, uh, founded a rock band and spent all my spare time bes beside the school in practicing my instruments and playing with my friends. I have to say that I was forced to play the piano when I was seven. Uh, and I must tell you that I didn't like playing the piano. So this, this was something my parents wanted me to do. But when I was infected by a sort of music that really touched me, uh, this was when I was 14 and I heard different music than classical music for the first time, I knew that I wanted to do something like this in my life. But then at the same time something happened as well, that I became interested in avant-garde uh, classical music, so to speak. This was also partly influenced by a certain rock band which I admired, whose um, members happened to be students of Karin Stockhausen, the famous German composer of early electronic music. And knowing or her, hearing the name of Stockhausen for the first time in my life as 14, I went to the library and tried to find books and records about him. And I found these books and they were very difficult to understand, full of diagrams and formulas and uh, tables of frequencies and images of his scores which were very interesting to look at but completely un understandable for me. So I started to listen to his music which I didn't like at all at the, at the first time but then when I bought my first record of his music I spent a lot of money to buy this record. So a lot of my um, private teenager money uh, I spent on this record of Kontakt. This is, was one of those key works of electronic music of the late 1950s and as I have spent so much money in this record I wanted to like this music and everybody knows in order to like something you have to uh, dedicate yourself to it and repeat the experiences a lot. So I was listening continuously to this music and at a certain uh, moment I became hooked. So uh, this music, which I didn't understand first, suddenly spoke to me. And then it became clear that besides doing my, my thing as a rock guitarist, I became very much interested in this uh, electronic music of the uh, avant-garde of the 1950s. Um, after school, I decided to study musicology. Uh, having studied chemistry for five years, um, this was an abrupt uh, cut in my projected career as a, as a as an, um, chemist. And it was very difficult to convince my parents that this was the right decision. Um, after studying two years of musicology, I felt the urgent need to do something practical with music, not only theoretically. So I um, applied f on the uh, University of Music as a student for composition and double bass and uh, luckily I was accepted to study there. And then I started to 
learn all the basic things about uh, Renaissance counterpoint, uh, harmonization in the style of Johann Sebastian Bach, and all the things of music history that were important to know. And at this time, uh, I completely separated myself from rock music and the experience of uh, playing with friends together on the stage. I also uh, lost my contact or my fascination with Stockhausen because I first uh, started to work everything up from the ground, which I didn't learn in school, at school, during my um, teenage years. And then, at a certain point, I changed my teacher and it happened that he, uh, I showed him what I have composed and he was very, very angry and upset and said, what are you doing? This is rubbish, this is nothing. You should decide, uh, dedicate yourself to contemporary music and not, not all this classical or historical stuff that you are doing. And this was a sort of shock for me first and then I understood that I had to reconnect to the, <laughs> those um, times, ten years before, when I was so much interested in avant-garde electronic music. And this was a sort of beginning of a real and serious career as a composer. One thing in your early story uh, puzzled me a little. You bought Stockhausen's records before you liked them. Mm -hmm. What was what was the motive? I, I mean, usually the way it goes is people like something and then buy it, yeah. but you bought it in order to learn to like it. Mm -hmm. What what was going on there? Well, the first things that I knew about Stockhausen was that uh, he wrote very interesting books about his music. So he was describing his concepts. And reading his texts was really fascinating for me, even as a 14 years old teenager who didn't understand much about contemporary music. But I was really uh, fascinated by his ideas. And then I thought, maybe uh, this could create some interesting music. But the music that I heard was shocking. It was something I never heard before and I couldn't consider it as music first. So then I had to uh, get into it, to uh, adopt my listening and also all my experience, my music experience, I had to um, question in a way. And then at a certain point I understood it and then I liked it. I see. So what intrigued you initially were the ideas. Yeah. Can you, since that's a first step, it might be worth staying there for just a minute. Can you tell, tell me a little bit about what ideas were specifically attractive to you or seemed interesting to you, interesting enough to yeah. learn to actually... Yeah. Well, as I told you before, I, I, I made this school for chemistry. And I was very much interested in, in uh, natural sciences. And Stockhausen's approach is, is in, a, in a way, also a scientific uh, approach. Because when he started as a composer right after the war, there was this idea not to connect to history or a given style of music, but to start from the beginning, from the scratch. So there was a situation of tabula rasa. Everything was white and questionable. And then he started to uh, define music by uh, directly operating on a mathematical basis with the elements of music. What are the elements of music? In, in Schockhausen's understanding, it was the, the domain of pitches, of frequencies, of energies, of timbre, of spectrum. And he was organizing those, what he called, parameters in a sort of mathematical ways by using formulas and numbers and a lot of functions that were interesting 
to observe. And this was maybe a connection between my chemistry studies and these advanced musical concepts of Stockhausen. So, there's an American humorist who, uh, Mark Twain, who said once about Wagner that his music is better than it sounds. And it, it, it sounds, I mean, as an outsider, mm -hmm. it sounds, well, it's hard to get my head around the idea of someone generating music from formulae of, of some sort, which he then expect, expects people to buy tickets for or <laughs> listen to while washing the dishes or why, what thought connected his formula to the psychology of his audience such that he would have any expectation that these formulae would result in pleasure or concert attendance or any of those things that musicians normally hope for. Yeah, well, you know, this was the idea of a utopia. So creating some, a new world which is not connected to the, the worlds we know. But on the a, on a, on a other level, there is a, a connection as well, because the formulas, let's call them formulas, the Schockhausen is used, are not formulas for dogs or cows. So <laughs> the, those are formulas for human beings uh, paying attention to the uh, abilities or, or the, the, the facilities of the ear, of the listening system, of our brain, and also of our knowledge of older music. So this is something that he was aware of, that he was on, on the one hand creating a very utopic situation, and on the other hand uh, connecting to the abilities of the human uh, system, so to speak. But you must imagine, as a 14 years old boy who was mostly interested in progressive rock music, uh, coming to a composer like Stockhausen is quite interesting because those worlds are really a lot of there's a big separation. So there, there was something in his person and also in his music that fascinated me. That's, that's, I haven't had any comparable experience, except one, which was I, I stumbled into a lecture by John Cage mm, really? as, a, as a musical ignoramus. I mean, wow. totally, I'd heard nothing, mm -hmm. not even classical stuff. I'd never played the piano. and. I think I remember every word of it. Yeah, it was it was like that. So these mm -hmm. it's the sort of the personal uh, power of these guys. The thing is, I never met Stockhausen at this time. I met him many many years later. But I wasn't interested in the person of, of Stockhausen. I was more interested in his weird concepts and in his utopian ideas. And later, uh, I when I learned to love his music, I really was fascinated by the things that he was doing. And the music of this band, it was a German progressive rock band called Can. They're, they're making something that was um, uh, some early uh, sort of predecessors of, of techno in a, in, a, in, a, in a way which was played 20 or 30 years later afterwards. Um, they made a music which is very much related to non-European uh, music as well as some types of Asian or African music. So maybe this was the, the idea to uh, leave the Austrian culture soil where I was uh, living, forgetting all Mozart and Bach and Beethoven and trying to find some fascinate, fascination in, a, in, uh, in, in sound or in music that was out of my, my focus and my education. I see. Um, can you say a little bit about this impulse to leave the Austrian cultural sphere behind? Where, where does that come from and what's that like? For you, or what, 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 what well, was I, at this time when I was a teenager, I, I didn't reflect it so much. 
but but later when I was uh, uh, studying music and musicology, I learned a lot of all the historical um, styles and and the concepts. I became more interested in music outside our cultural uh, horizon, and for me, music became a sort of utopian concept, and this reconnects to Stockhausen, something where we can uh, try to uh, climb up a mountain and look into the uh, beyond the horizon that we know and see and discover other things that might tell us uh, more about us ourselves in a new way. So I became more and more interested in in, in, in broaden my experience and to open my mind to the unknown. This word utopia keeps emerging here. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I guess I, I, I'd like to know a little more about what what is in that word for you. How do you understand the sort of musical utopia? Well, I think the, the, the function of music is not entertainment. Hmm? Music can, in my opinion, is something that can be seen as a sort of drug. Uh, some, it's not it's not a physical drug, but a, a drug that comes into your ears and that can change your mind and can also change your experience and put you into a, a state of um, let's call it trance, where you maybe switch off your ratio and your mind and experience things which you would not have experienced not by listening to music. I mean you can open your mind by reading books, by having interesting conversations, by meeting people, by uh, doing sports or uh, physical um, exercise. But you can also experience new things and reconnect to deep levels of your unconsciousness by listening and this is the thing that becomes more and more interesting for me even though I'm working a lot with those utopian let's say scientific pseudo scientific mathematical concepts in music but the aim is to uh, reach deeper levels of my soul and my conscious and the consciousness or subconsciousness of my audience as well. From the lecture I heard from John Cage, uh, the purpose of music is to sober and quiet the mind and prepare it for contact with divine influences. Mm -hmm. This but, was in his Buddhistic period, yes, when you say this, yes. yes. Yes, he also talked a lot about mushrooms in that period. I think, but that's... but he, I think he was not not uh, mentioning those uh, uh, poisonous or or uh, how call we those mushrooms psilocybin. He yeah. was not referring to the drug, but he was the mushroom was for him uh, a symbol for something that you find uh, in the woods and and you cannot plant them because they they happen. And you can, and if you have a sober mind and a good a good uh, eye, you will detect the mushrooms and then you find them. And and there are so many species of mushrooms, so you have to have a good knowledge of them in, in order to survive if you eat them. This is something he means. Nice. But you are right. I mean, uh, I'm. I have a very good connection to Cage, and we met. And we worked together for a project once, but uh, I'm not sharing his idea of um, sound that just happens by itself. So I, I'm, I'm, I have a different idea about music. Music has a lot to do with something that you achieve by by work, and not uh, by just let it happen. I also had, uh, estimate his ideas uh, of clearing your mind, of being sober and open yourself to something that is beyond our 
horizon, but in a different way. And, and I'm not, I'm neither a fellow, a follower of Stockhausen nor, nor a follower of Cage, but I, I, I drew a lot of inspirations from both. Persons. And I take it the point at which you agree with Cage, at least, is that music is a doorway to some sort of experience of life that might not be achievable any other way. Yes, absolutely. I, like I see. Mm -hmm. I see. So, um, I mean, the other player in this history, this early history, is rock music. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and is that something... I mean, looking back now and from an understanding of so many kinds of music, is that something quite different? Is that simply entertainment, or how do you how do you understand that first stuff you played? Well, for me, this was it has not, nothing to do with entertainment. It was uh, it has this um, this rich ritualistic aspect, and also this aspect of getting, losing yourself in the, in the music, in the sound, in the dancing, or in the energy of, 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 of playing and, and, and listening. Um, and, 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 you know, for a long time in my life, uh, after I was, I finished my studies and became a professional composer, rock music was not an issue. But later, after my first big successes as a composer, I remember those times when I was playing uh, on stage, improvising, and in the, in the years before I was a um, composer sitting mostly at home at his desk and writing very complex scores. But after a while of doing that I became very unhappy with the situation and I was uh, longing for this experience that I had when I was 20 when I played with my friends in rock and jazz bands and made a lot of very interesting experiences with playing music without knowing what I'm doing, just by improvising, by reacting on people. And then I was, uh, how old was I, end of 30, and I thought I would like to go back to this stage. But how? It's impossible that I take my guitar and play because it's, it's over. I'm not a rock musician. I don't want to be it. So I have to find my my own instruments, and this is what I started to create in the in the late 1990s. Uh, instruments based on computer programs that I developed myself, and then I started to, besides my professional career as a composer who uh, write scores, I started another. Uh, career as an electronic musician who performs on stage with others, mostly improvising. So this is, looks like a, a, a contradiction. On the one hand, uh, conceptualizing music, uh, writing it down in a very precise manner so that musician can reproduce it. On the other hand, doing something completely contrary making music on the fly, out of nothing, out of the situation. And nowadays, now, in, in, the, in the last 10-15 years, I was trying to combine those two different uh, domains. Now I remember from the deficient music education I've had, that Mozart did had something of the same thing going on, and that he composed and then left spaces for people to do things, to, to improvise at various points. Well, this was a practice at this time. Uh, but it, it, but they, were, they were improvising uh, to a system, to a rule system that was existing. And the, the improvisation that I am confer, uh, uh, um, I'm speaking about is those improvisation which is not based on a given melody or a formal concept or a, an idea. It's improvisation, that it's called free improvisation, that starts from nothing, that starts like our conversation. We're just uh, putting things 
into the game and reacting on each other. And this, to, with musicians that uh, I, 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 I do not know, so let's say uh, people I met first, I, I, I started to create a series of, of um, meetings with those people on stage where we play in front of the audience for the first time without knowing each other and 99% of those so-called blind gigs like a blind date were successful and very successful because we started to make a sort of intelligent conversation with our instruments with our sounds with our music on stage wow. in front of an audience we, it's, it's a challenge but this is something where I learned so much also in my development of my instruments how can I make make them so reactive, like a, a musician on a trombone. So this notion of improvisation is actually closer to the theater notion of improvisation. Mm -hmm. I mean, because uh, theater improv is, is just, you know, I mean, the, the rule in theater improv is never say no. Yeah. Okay. Accept whatever impulse is thrown at you and do yeah. something with it. And also with uh, dance, there is a um, a branch in, in in modern dance like contact improvisation, oh, yes. where people are are in in a they have a very uh, strong bodily presence on stage, and they they really um, get in contact with each other. So also they bang and and they do something. Uh, hard physical action, and this is something I, I, I like also in, 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 in improvisation with other musicians. Not this clean setting where you sit on a laptop, uh, glancing at the screen and doing some movements with your mouse, but I, I, I like this bodily expression. So this is the reason why, I, even though I am using laptops, the laptop is uh, played by the means of external controllers, which are sort of um, extensions of my bodies, or let's say um, adapters that connects my body to the software. Nice. So I, I've, I've run into this before with some folks in Canada. You're actually inventing instruments yes. in the sense of inventing these Mm -hmm. ways of translating bodily movement through the software into sound. Yes. Ah, fascinating. So they're physical things. Yeah. Uh, I can show you afterwards. So okay, I, great. This is what I'm planning for uh, afterwards, that, yeah. we, that I give you a, a, a short, uh, spontaneous improvisation of, of something that is very new and never have been played before live, because this is something I prepared for the concert next week. Nice. When I'm meeting um, an electronic musician from Germany, which I never met before. So we will meet uh, literally on stage for the first time and then we play. Now, uh, could you clarify one thing? You are preparing something for this concert. How does the preparation and the spontaneous, how do those two mm -hmm. things go together? The preparation, the preparation is building the instrument. Ah. And, and maybe also um, creating a sort of vocabulary with this. And with this uh, instrument and with this uh, vocabulary, I can speak. I see. And then the the performer whom you've never met before, who joins you on stage, is he using the same instrument, no, or he's, he, he's using something else? He's using his own voice, and and he has created some um, electronic processing of his voice, which he controls also with some physical um, devices that he created. So he's working in a, in a maybe a maybe in a very similar way to me. I only know what, what he was doing by looking at some videos that I found about him on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So I understood what he was doing. I was listening. I was understanding his sonic world. And and I'm what I'm trying now to do is to create an instrument where we can uh, speak on the same level to each other. So he comes with the instrument that he's invented that you know something about from YouTube, video, YouTube videos. Only the sound that Only comes out, sound. but I don't know how it works. I see. And he comes to you 
likely with the same kind of understanding of what you're up to from having watched YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. And then you meet and play. We, yes. And whatever happens, happens. Yes, whatever happens, happens. But the thing is, it, everything what we do is governed by our ears. So we, we're listening and we're trying to communicate it. As we are doing. I see. We, we're not talking, speaking nonsense. So mm -hmm. we're trying to understand and and communicate. The same we do with our sons. Yes. So, a very elementary question, in this sort of a concert meeting, who begins? <laughs> do you flip a coin? <laughs> no. Someone. I see. Sometimes it happens that, that uh, we make a, a decision that we say, you start or I start. But most of the time, we, uh, we don't speak about it. I see. So you're just up there. So perhaps you both start at once. I mean, you know, as a musician, you can start very softly. I see. With some sounds that are so soft that you won't notice them as music. Maybe you have the feeling that it's something, some, a little fly or a bird in the space. Yes. So there are some techniques how to start the conversation. I mean, normally you, you're speaking about the weather with someone in order to connect yourself. So there are some techniques for the, mu the musicians who, who play first. So they, they, maybe they would start with a very soft uh, situation that gives space and room for the other to connect. Must not be, but this is uh, something which mostly works. So, how old is this idea of improvisation in this sense? How long has it had to develop traditions and <laughs> practices and so forth? You mean in general? Yes, I, or, I mean... Or in my music? Well, I'm just thinking... Uh, I, I guess I'm interested in both questions. I mean, there must have been a time at some date or other when no one had mm -hmm. ever done this exact thing, mm -hmm. brought two people together without any rules or agenda to see what happened. Uh, what would that date be? I mean, there is a, a tradition in, in jazz, in free jazz. Ah. This is the start. But in free jazz, there was uh, this... Um, concept of uh, high energy, very fast, very loud, very virtuosic. So people were coming on stage and starting to make high energy noise together. This is one concept, but this is something I don't like so much. I, but I'm, I'm more interested in creating something together by carefully listening and by shaping things. But, but, and, this is music that is also enjoyable for the listener. It's not something that is rude and is with the ass into your face, but it's something that the, even the non-educated listener would uh, find attractive because she can follow what's happening and she understands that there is something um, uh, comparable to a language which is abstract but it tells something, and she maybe would notice that these vocabularies in, in form of sounds are um, interpreted by the other, and there is this conversation going on. I see. Um, so, I think what you're saying about free jazz is that there's still a whole lot of, of expectations about how one will play when one starts. Yep. And part of what you're doing is to have those not on the stage, those expectations. Yes, in the, in the, in the best form it is like that. So it's, it's like meeting someone for the first time. You know there is this uh, uh, dating, uh, yes. blind dates. So uh, you, you meet someone for the first time and you're interested to get in contact with him or to get to know about her. Yes. And this is something I, I was bringing to this uh, level of playing together. So this concept is, is a one-to-one -one session. So it, it, it is mostly successful with two people involved. 
So this is the, 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 the difficult situation, the most difficult situation, because there is not a third one which can take over your part for a time and, and, and that you have a pause. Or, so there's always this one-to-one -one situation, like, like, in a, like, like now. Yes. Yes, and so it's, it's going to be exhausting for the it can be It can be exhausting, but also very um, uh, what is the word for that? Um, it gives you a lot back. It's, it's something that, that it's, it gives you a lot of rewards. Yeah? And in fact, it, I have played with very, very many different people. Uh, musicians from all different types of instruments and different types of musical styles. But it happened that uh, I, I uh, became more and more interested also to work with the same people for a longer period. So I have a duo with a singer, for example, with Agnes Heginger. She's an Austrian jazz singer, quite famous. And we have a duo where we um, improvise together, always without any preparations, but based on poems that she brings. She always comes with some poems, and I don't know what, what they are. And then we start to interpret those poems live on stage. And if you uh, listen to them or see our YouTube videos, you will notice that those poems, if, if you don't know how it's done, you will have the um, feeling that what we are doing is, is, is not improvised, but it's, it's, a, it's a piece. Yeah? So it's, it's with such a strong a relationship and the knowledge of each other that people uh, after the concert uh, express their uh, interest that they say how is it possible that you play this music this it's not improvised it, it looks or it it, it, it uh, appears like something that is composed yeah? and this is the this is another utopian concept to uh, create something like a composition by completely different means, by the means of real-time composition. Composition normally takes place out of time, so you imagine something in time, and then you start to write it down. But this concept is, so to speak, composition in real time. And the most interesting thing is if it's done by two or three people in real time together, as a sort of a communication process. And this, this reconnects to this old interest of myself in Kubernetes, so that we are creating a sort of Kubernetes network. And by changing little small parameters in the system, we can make a lot of diff a, a very strong changes in the system. Fascinating. Now, how important is the audience to this whole network? The audience is extremely important because I, I, I could do all those improvisations here in my studio without any audience but I never do that. I always want to do that live with an audience. It creates a completely different energy and it uh, uh, forces you to be very aware and very sober and very um, creative. So you cannot make and a mistake, so to speak, because you want to give the best. And, and the situation of an audience uh, creates so much, much expectations and for you so much adrenaline that you produce in your body that you play a hundred times better if you do it without an audience. See. And the audience, uh, they uh, act like a mirror, so they even though they are not speaking and we don't see them, but we, we feel the energy of those people. And this is so important. It's, it's a sort of invisible influence. It, it's some, some, something, an, a stream of energy from this, those people that I uh, get like connecting myself to the electric currency in a way. Yeah? Yes. Now, I'm curious about numbers here. I mean, I about what? Numbers. Numbers. That is, mm -hmm. two is strenuous and powerful. Mm -hmm. Three would change the dynamic. Mm -hmm. 
Would four be impossible? No. Uh, I think interesting is two, because this is the one-to-one -one situation where you cannot escape. Three is also interesting because you have a triangle and have a lot of combination, mm -hmm. duos, three different duos, three different solos, and one uh, tutti. One. Four is interesting insofar as four is two and two, so you can create two uh, duos or two uh, positions that are communicating with each other. But five is also acceptable, but if it becomes more than five, then for me it becomes very chaotic. I see. So for more than five, you, you'd have to compose? Yes, yeah, I see. absolutely. I see. Do you find anything in the early history of music or in your imagination about the early mm -hmm. history of music that works this way? I mean, do you, do, you, do, you, do you imagine that music arose in something like this way? Or do you think that this, this idea of spontaneous improvisation is something that is, as it were, being discovered late? I mean, I mean uh, most, of, most music is improvised. Folk music or music of other... Um, uh, other regions than European regions, but they are always based on a tradition, on a history. Uh, African kalimba music, for example, it is not notated, but there's a lot of uh, oral history telling people how to build the instruments, how to play them, how to play this pattern, how to uh, work in this environment. But the idea of music that is created without a rule system at the moment, I think it's something very modern and something very contemporary, which has also to do with our, with our times that we have uh, the possibilities nowadays to do something out of rules. I see. So it's, it's, the, it's the, as it were, the fruition of a very long period history of development. Mm. Huh. I'm remembering as you're speaking, some, my, my, my daughter's a composer, although, you know, purely amateur so far. But I remember when she was uh, probably six, seven, we used to do games like that, where I would make a sound and she would make a sound back and mm -hmm. try to get into a rhythm and the rhythm would oh, yeah. change. And it was because I knew no rules and she knew no rules. It was totally, uh, cool. uh, totally spontaneous, but it was just what I did with this particular kid because this was how she responded. Mm -hmm. This was the sort of thing she could do with me. Uh, and probably the most successful things mm -hmm. we ever did together with mm -hmm. that. I, I'm, I'm suspecting that other parents with musical kids may have stumbled onto that same exercise. It was it was deeply uh, interesting mm -hmm. that it just happened. We didn't plan it. Um, good. I know you teach, mm -hmm. among other things, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering, given your love of improvisation and of spontaneity and of that kind of discovery that comes when people come together without an agenda, I'm wondering if that comes into your teaching if that informs your teaching, mm -hmm. or if your teaching is quite separate from no. that idea? Well, you know, uh, what I'm teaching is uh, graduate students. So they have, they have already their the basics, and they are starting to become uh, individual composers. So they, have, they are now searching their own language, their own style, and I try to accompany them on her way, on their way and not forcing them into a certain direction. So I'm I'm trying to be like a, a mirror, reflecting what they show me and and helping them to uh, find the right expression or express their ideas in the best possible way. So I'm not I'm I'm not trying to. Uh, uh, 
force them in the, in, into a certain direction. But I'm, if I am speaking, I'm always speaking about my own experience, and as always, of course, those ideas of improvisation play a role. But but if they are uh, writing an orchestra piece, there is no no way for improvisation. So I'm I'm reacting on in 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 a, in a, in a matter in a manner that helps them to write this orchestra piece. Do you think it's possible? To bring along graduate musicians to do what you're doing on stage. Well, it's interesting that that some of my music of my of my uh, students and um, those people who had just finished their studies became uh, are doing similar things that I was I'm doing. Also um, having those this mix of conceptual work and improvisational work. And building their own instruments, so it seems that there is something that influences those people who study with me in a way. Yeah, they they are doing their things in a very very uh, uh, um, personal uh, way, which is not connected to me. But there seems that nowadays this concept of a composer who is just a, a person sitting on a piece of paper and, and writing music is something which is changing now. I see. And I would guess that's something that it's very hard for the university or the academy to recognize. <laughs> Why? Well, I just mean because, for instance, one has to say this composition is, first of all, the person's, and second, it's of a certain quality. But to the extent that for instance, two people improvising on the stage are dependent on each other. It isn't quite the person. Yes. So this is an, an extreme uh, position. But between writing a, a completely determined score and having this free improvisation of two, there's a lot of intermediate steps in between. And music uh, takes place in, in, this, in, this, in this variety of possibilities. Mm -hmm. so, the, so the academy can, as it were, award a doctorate for something in the middle of the range, or yes, I mean my, my students do a lot of different things, uh, mm -hmm. so they can they can write string uh, quartets and they can make a sound installation. They can write computer programs, so they're very versatile and uh, they find their field in which they eventually make the doctorate afterwards. So you've you've told me a lot about this improvisation because it's. It's clearly so interesting to me. And also at the moment, because I'm preparing myself for this concert next week. <laughs> so, but then the, the other question, I mean, do you continue to write music yes, yes, at the same of time? Of course, it's so important. Uh -huh. I always uh, write music at, at the same time. So uh, I just finished uh, two major compositions that are being premiered in, in the next uh, weeks and months. Uh, purely instrumental music without any electronics, with completely determined scores, no improvisation, no random operations, composed music that uh, is printed in a score. And you said that's important. Yes, because, Why? you know, on, on the one hand, it's, it's interesting to have this freedom of doing things on the fly. And on the other hand, it's so rewarding to put something in the to put something on paper and 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 define it in the best possible way. So for me, uh, I like so much to uh, create a piece of music which is like a jewel. So it's perfect. There's a lot of uh, a long process until before it gets to this point. But once it's finished, it's something that has the, the quality of an oeuvre, of, of a rock, that can be viewed like, a, 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 let's, let's say like a jewel, you can see it from different sides, you can as, uh, see how the, the light is changing the colors in it. But it's something that is completely formed, that's not amorphous, it's something that is uh, a body, 
of mind and ideas which can be interpreted by musicians. Now, how important is it to you that it be interpreted by musicians? I mean, I, I th I'm thinking of musicians as the point at which your control ends. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. piece will be played as well as the musicians whom you have on that particular stage are capable of playing it. And I'm wondering, if you ha do you have any temptation in the direction of you know, sort of replacing the musician? Well, I love working with musicians and I love this idea of interpretation of a score. In fact, I'm working a lot with the musicians that commissioned me for, for, for compositions. Uh, I'm not writing music uh, into the white. It's always uh, for most of the mostly in the, in the last 10 years for people who asked me or I asked to write music for them and so I, I try to understand how she's playing, what she's playing, what are her um, specialities and then I try also to get hold of those instruments. I, I cannot play violin but if I, when, I, when I start writing a piece for the violin I start first getting my violin and trying out special things that nobody has before tried or found on the violin. Because I'm interested to use this historical body of, an, of a violin, which has a long tradition and a, a large, a beautiful repertory, and go beyond this notion of this instrument and trying to see it like a child, like a, a piece of wood which you can also throw on the, on, on, on the ground and make noise with it. And then I, I start to reformulate this instrument and maybe finding different ways of handling it beyond the classical um, technique with the left and right hand and all this music that has been composed using this classical or traditional concepts. So if I'm understanding right, your work, your, your compositional work is, is also in a way a kind of dialogue, that is you are, you're composing for yeah. particular people yes. whom you know and understand, and you understand their instruments, you understand what they want, yes. and so it's not out of relationship no. To, no. to anyone, yeah. even though it's not like the things on the stage spontaneous response. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so it must be very strange for you to, um, to try to, to think about someone like Mozart who composed a great, I mean, I'm, I'm imagining, composed a great deal. I mean, he composed things for particular people, surely. Composed a great deal just <laughs> out of his head. <laughs> but this, uh, yeah, I have composed like this before. But there was a point when I said I, I, I want to uh, not re reduplicate uh, things that other people have already done. And I found a very interesting uh, um, way of working with instruments and, and understanding instruments and also working in relationships to musicians. Right. And the output of this uh, research that I'm doing the fruits are much more interested and more personal than if I, I'm, I'm sitting there and, 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 and writing music as I did in the 90s, for example. This is music that is still uh, something I like, this type of music that I composed, but now I, I, I found, found a completely different way, much more in relationship to someone and not out of a, of a concept that I have in my head. So, the old delight in playing with people and in having a relationship to the audience and responding to the audience from the rock days mm -hmm. is kind of back in full force now. In, in a way, yes, yes. Maybe uh, this is why I'm, I'm quite happy at, at the moment that I, I, I found um, a way of, of integrating those old uh, streams of consciousness or 
types of music experiences from, from my early years uh, into my major composer being. I see. Um, I'm wondering if you see yourself at the beginning of something or in the middle of something or in the sort of complete air, you know, realm of something. I mean, mm -hmm. you're, you're 54 years old. Uh, given the way lifespans work, mm -hmm. you could have 34 years, you know, you could have 30 years more of really high maybe, quality maybe work, year, you know? know, but you don't know. But yeah. I'm thinking, do you imagine yourself continuing in this mode in the into the indefinite future, mm -hmm. uh, is that that kind well, of picture? Uh, this is a good question. I, I, uh, this is something I like uh, of John Cage. That even though he was composing a lot of things and became a very famous and important artist in in the twentieth century, he was so inventive until his last years. So he never stopped progressing, and and to researching and going to new other directions. For example, in, in Wisham Arts, uh, there, it seems to be that artists tend to become a master in a, in a certain field. So they, they have formulated a, a certain type of painting, a style, and then they paint hundreds of pictures in this style. But if you look at other artists like Picasso, he has a certain periods and, and in this period he formulated the language and then he, he painted hundreds of um, pictures in it. Uh, and I'm maybe someone who tries to always to challenge himself uh, to go into the un unknown and to discover things uh, beyond my, my experience. And this is also the reason why I like to work with computer programs. Because those, I, those, uh, um, this this work with trying to formulate an idea in, in terms of an algorithm or of, of a computer language, this helps me to understand what I want to do in a better way. So it kind of leads you into places you wouldn't ordinarily. Yes, exactly. So for me, the computer is in a, in a way a sort of. Can, can be something like an inspiration machine, but a machine that I have constructed myself. I see. Well, thank you.